What would your city look like if a large volcano erupted, burning everything in its path, dividing the landscape in a matter of moments between piles of ash and lava flows? Unfortunately, the ancient inhabitants of Pompeii did not have to imagine this terrible scenario. And for good reason, the Italian city was completely destroyed. Pompeii experienced the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD. On October 24th, the volcano erupted. Shortly after 13 hours, the Plinian phase began. Surprisingly, this eruption occurred the day after Volcanalia, the festival of the Roman god of fire and volcanoes. The devastation was immense. The ashes covered the entire city. The inhabitants of Pompeii instead of suffocating in the ashes, were killed immediately by the powerful heat. The volcano spewed out superheated gases, which raced down the mountainside, causing avalanches and reaching temperatures of over 1200 degrees Celsius, or more than 2100 degrees Fahrenheit. Dear traveler, good morning. Today, I'm taking you to explore one of the most significant natural disasters in history. Before you leave for your adventure, please like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss anything. Thank you all and enjoy the video. In Southern Italy, Vesuvius, also known as Mount Vesuvius or Italian Vesuvius, rises above the Bay of Naples in the Campania Plain. Almost all of its western base is on the bay. After each major eruption, the height of the volcano varies considerably, reaching today an altitude of 1,281 meters or 4,202 feet. Vesuvius probably formed about 200,000 years ago. Although it is a relatively young volcano, it had been dormant for centuries before the great eruption of 79 AD buried Pompeii and the surrounding towns. Founded in the 6th century BC, the city of Pompeii was made famous historically for this reason. Vesuvius erupted and completely destroyed the city. During the Roman Empire, it was a prosperous city, but not as famous as it is today. Pompeii has been continuously excavated for over 2,000 years, making it the longest excavated site in the world. And for good reason, the ashes of Pompeii's volcanic eruption have immortalized Roman life of the time. A volcano with an altitude of a thousand meters, Vesuvius borders the Bay of Naples to the east of the city. This mountain is still active today and has experienced more than 50 eruptions since the one that devastated the city of Pompeii. Today, Pompeii allows us to understand Roman life and architecture better than ever before. In its beginnings, in the 6th century, the city grouped together several villages of the Oska and was controlled by the Greeks. Then, between the 6th and 7th century, the Etruscans, people coming from Tuscany, invaded the city. The Greeks in the 5th century BC then took control of the city. It is during the 1st century BC that Pompeii becomes totally Roman. In 62 BC, an earthquake occurred. 17 years later, the volcano of Vesuvius awakens and completely decimates the city. But what exactly was the city of Pompeii before the tragedy? How did the Pompeians live? What was their culture, their daily life? For more than 1500 years, the city of Pompeii has been asleep buried under the volcanic ashes of Vesuvius. Since the discovery of the site in 1748, Pompeii has become a very famous archaeological site. In fact, the most famous in the world, as its past still seems to be anchored today in the present. But if the majority of the people know today the eruption of the volcano in Pompeii, who really knows the before Pompeii? When we visit the ruins today, we can wonder how such a city could really exist. 
its inhabitants, its businesses, its life. The city had, however, a major role at the time, and it is thanks to the technology of the 21st century that we could discover what Pompeii looked like before the volcanic eruption. The history of this ancient Roman city, now an Italian town, has seen many cultures. In the 8th century BC, Greek settlers brought the city into the Hellenistic sphere. In the 2nd century BC, Pompeii came under the influence of Rome, and the Bay of Naples became a popular vacation destination for wealthy Romans. By the early 1st century AD, Pompeii was a thriving resort town for the most distinguished Roman citizens. The cobblestone streets were lined with elegant homes and villas, taverns and cafes, public baths, brothels, and small factories all crowded with tourists, townspeople, and slaves. The 20,000 seat arena received many visitors and the open air squares and markets were bustling with activity. About 12,000 people lived in Pompeii, and almost as many in the surrounding area on the eve of the terrible eruption in 79 AD. Before that, the city had a complex water system, a strategic harbor, and more than 100 streets that were once bustling with activity by the Pompeians, the inhabitants of Pompeii, but also attractive places like forums, baths, an amphitheater, and much more. At that time, the forums were the real heart of public life. These squares represent both the religious and political center where the inhabitants of the city of Pompeii gather. It is also the economic heart of the city, the place where transactions and commercial exchanges take place. The theaters of the time is an important place for the inhabitants who met there to see or play comedies and tragedies. The Basilica the building shelters the doom veers presiding over the justice. The inhabitants also meet there during the cold season for business meetings on legal and economic problems, which are also treated on the forum. The Comitium is a building reserved for the elections of the magistrates of the city. The amphitheater of Pompeii can accommodate 20,000 spectators, amphitheater in which gladiatorial fights are held, an entertainment very popular with the inhabitants at the time. The baths or public baths include two sections, one reserved for men and the other for women. But both have a frigidarium, i.e. a cold room, a tepidarium, a warm room, and finally a caudarium, a hot room. The thermal baths had a major role in Pompeii. It was a real space of social exchange and relaxation. The Great Palestra, that is to say, the Great Gymnasium, was a space that served both as a sports field and a slave market, but also as a place of education for young Pompeians. The temples are intended for the religious activities of the city. And finally, the Macellum is the big market where the population buys its fish and meat. Concerning the life of the inhabitants, here's what it was on the side of the food and the place of the family for the Pompeians. The city was, for the most part, similar to other Roman colonies in terms of daily life. In Pompeii, typical families were mainly patriarchal. Families were much larger in ancient Rome than they are today. Not only were there more children, but slaves and servants belonging to the family were also considered family members. children from poor families had to help their parents work and follow their parents' professions. A Roman wedding usually began with the bride offering her childhood toys at the family shrine. After the sacrifice, the priest would inspect the entrails of the sacrificed animal to determine if the marriage was approved by the gods. After a feast, it is customary for the groom to carry his wife to the threshold of his house to signify that she is now in his care. As for food, most Romans did not eat during the day. 
Instead, they ate a light breakfast and then enjoyed a sumptuous dinner in the evening. Bread, porridge, and stew were part of the diet of the poorer citizens. However, a wide variety of extravagant dishes were served to the wealthier citizens. Fruit, eggs, cheese, cold meat, and honey were common foods for the Pompeians. The people of Pompeii did not consume sugar, and honey was a rare commodity. Because of the fertile land that produced grapes in the Campania region, where the towns of Vesuvius are located, wine was abundant. In Pompeii and also in Herculaneum, the nearby city, diluted wine was the most popular drink. In fact, it was considered disrespectful to drink it undiluted. Pliny the Elder mentions that Pompeian wines are rather dangerous, as they can cause headaches that last until noon the following day, which shows the power of the grapes grown in the fertile lands of Campania. Pompeii and Herculaneum were known for their sumptuous evening meals. The etiquette of these meals was very strict. Nine people were considered the perfect number, as three could sit on the sides of the table. The left hand held the plate while the right hand ate. In Roman societies, women were allowed to participate in meals with men, unlike in Greek societies. Other rules of etiquette common to Roman dinners are also described in the House of the Moralist in Pompeii. An inscription on the wall states, do not cast lustful glances or look at another man's wife. Do not be rude in conversation. Restrain yourself from getting angry or using offensive language. If you can't, go back to your own house. In the decades leading up to the eruption of Vesuvius that buried Pompeian ash in 79 AD, there was no shortage of celebrations in the city. In fact, these are the words found on the wall of a Pompeii tomb discovered in 2017 and recently deciphered. According to this inscription, a rich young man reaches adulthood by organizing a huge party dedicated to this passage to a new stage in his life. According to the tomb's writings, the person in question held a large party that included a banquet for 6,840 guests and a show in which 416 gladiators fought for several days. Yes, nearly 2,000 years ago, this southern Italy city was very lively. But then, how did the people of Pompeii enjoy themselves? Public entertainment was one of the main pleasures of Pompeii's citizens. These ancient entertainments included gladiatorial fights, animal hunts, rituals, and even executions. Many public events were held each year in the great amphitheater of Pompeii. Everyone was invited to attend these public shows, regardless of who they were. It was indeed a true symbol of communion between the social classes. Public baths were an integral part of daily life in Pompeii. Unlike today, bathing was a public event that involved mingling with others, chatting and relaxing with friends and neighbors. The thermal baths of Pompeii had huge pools and steam rooms where citizens washed themselves while taking their time. For this ancient civilization, it was not only a practical daily chore, but also the only time to relax for some during the working day. Visiting the baths was a gentle and relaxing break for all members of the community. Even though some of the inhabitants of Pompeii ate in the street, the refined feasts took place in triclinniums, i.e. dining rooms or gardens. They held many feasts in their homes for their friends and associates throughout the week. During the feasts, the host served a wide range of expensive food and drink to show off his wealth. Private dinners included flamingo meat, imported seafood, and even giraffe. The more exotic the food, the more impressive the feast. High society also consumed a lot of imported or high-class wine, served in buckets and jugs filled to the brim. Whatever imported food was served was usually boiled 
smoked, fried, or baked, and usually seasoned with fish sauce or thick syrup wine. The food was therefore incredibly rich, which the citizens of Pompeii enjoyed, some of whom could even afford rich desserts like stuffed dates dipped in honey. Festivals were a very important part of Roman religious life in Pompeii in ancient times. They were called feriés, and there were three types. Some were fixed date festivals, others were mobile festivals, and the third were festivals organized on request. The rich families of Pompeii or the Roman church financed the celebrations, depending on the festival. Finally, Prostitution was both socially and legally tolerated in ancient Pompeian society. Roman men regularly went to these brothels to let off steam or have fun as a group. At that time, a brothel was not stigmatized and even less taboo in the city, as it was considered a typical store like any other service. Several small rooms were filled with flickering candles, beautiful curtains, and a sensual atmosphere. The buildings were built with smaller windows, so to create stunning scenery, huge frescoes of exotic acts were painted on the walls. The archaeological excavations of Pompeii are therefore an exceptional source of information about daily life in Pompeii. Historians of the Roman era have described a daily life that is not unlike that of our grandparents. Simple actions made up daily life and it was far from the life we live today. But then, what was a typical day like in Pompeii? Apart from these entertainments that the Pompeians regularly indulged in, what was a typical day like? Let's find out, hour by hour. Ora prima diurna, between 5 and 6 a.m. In the absence of electricity, the Pompeians live according to the rhythm of the sun. They start their day very early. Most of the citizens take water from the public fountains, as only a few houses have them. Because of its importance, water is used sparingly. The Romans used the thermal baths for washing and personal care. They ate bread and cheese for breakfast, possibly with vegetables or leftovers. In addition to being a place for discussion and relaxation, the barber shops open at sunrise. Ora Secunda, between 6 and 7 a.m. The merchant and slaves are at work. The markets are open. The farmers are working in the fields. Everyone goes about their daily business. or a corta between 8 and 9 a.m. People are crowding the streets, vendors are busy, and citizens are buying what they need. People walk, talk, and discuss the city's problems in the forum. Or a septima between 12 and 1 p.m. This hour is a time to relax. The amphitheater is sometimes used as a place where gladiators are exhibited by rich nobles. The show is very brutal and violent. We could not appreciate it today. Shows with gladiators were banned for several years after a violent fight broke out between the fans of Pompeii and those of Norsera, resulting in several deaths. In response to the request of Pompeia, the wife of Emperor Nero, the latter reinstated them. This is also a good time for a break with bread, cakes, fish, fruit, etc. Ora Octava, between 1 and 2 p.m. This is the time for thermal baths. Slaves can also use them and they are cheap. It is the best way for people to wash themselves while relaxing or having fun at a time when only a few houses had access to water. In Roman times, the average life expectancy was 35 years, higher than in previous and subsequent periods. Human health was improved by the discovery of hygiene, which was little known to Romans at the time. 
At that time, hot water was used instead of cold water. However, the baths should not be considered as modern beauty centers. Business and politics were also conducted there. These facilities are also used for exercise. Hora decima, between 4 and 5 p.m. The locals dine before sunset, eating olives, eggs, fish, meat, and cakes if they can afford them. They don't have much opportunity to entertain themselves in the evening. So this is what the daily life of the Pompeians seemed to be like at the time. A rather classical daily life, one might think, in a city that played a major role at the time. Pompeii was an important inland port, a center of trade, industry, and business, and at the time known for its fermented fish sauce. Its population was a mixture of wealthy elites, professionals, and slaves. The various inscriptions found attest to the presence of bakers and bathers, grape pickers and prostitutes. The recent deciphering of writing tablets from Herculaneum suggests that more than half of the population of Pompeii was composed of slaves or free slaves. What was the place of religion for the Pompeians? The inhabitants of Pompeii believed in several deities and several gods, cults, and foreign religions. The Romans believed that their gods had feelings similar to those of humans and had the power to destroy individuals if they did not satisfy them with offerings and worship. The most important gods in Pompeii were the traditional gods that the inhabitants were required to worship under Roman rule. In Pompeii, the Temple of Jupiter at the north end of the Forum was not enthusiastically rebuilt after the earthquake of 62 AD, suggesting that the inhabitants were not particularly devoted to the traditional gods. This lax attitude toward the traditional gods was considered the reason for the destruction of the city, according to Roman beliefs. Venus, however, was worshipped with fervor as evidenced by the many images depicting her in the city's public spaces. Pompeii's love for the goddess of love is due to Sulla, the Roman conqueror of Pompeii who dedicated the city to her. The reconstruction of the Temple of Venus after the earthquake had barely begun when the eruption of Vesuvius buried it in 79 AD. The inhabitants of Pompeii, along with the traditional gods, venerated many foreign gods and participated in cults. The mysterious cult of Isis was a Hellenistic organization based on the reconstruction of Egyptian mythology. It was introduced to Pompeii at the end of the 2nd century BC by sailors and merchants and quickly became the most important cult. The second most important cult was related to Bacchus, derived from Dionysus, the god of fertility. This cult was popular with women. It involved feasting and sacrifices after fasting. In Pompeii, the lost city, the worshippers would then perform a passionate and wild dance in which they lost their inhibitions and were freed from mortality. Religion in Pompeii was full of traditional deities, cults, and foreign religions, as shown by the Temple of Jupiter, the domestic sanctuaries, and the cults of Bacchus and Isis. Geographically speaking, Pompeii is located in Campania, a region on the west coast of Italy and on the eastern slopes of the Apennines. Campania is a very fertile plain, crossed by two large rivers and endowed with rich soil. Pompeii is located on a plateau formed by an ancient lava deposit southwest of Mount Vesuvius. The city is also located a short distance north of the Sarno River and east of the Bay of Naples. The location of the city ensured its importance as a trading center. Pompeii was a fairly important city at the time, more cosmopolitan than Rome. It controlled the neighboring city-states and was a center for trade in crops, wine, and olive oil. Its culture was extremely rich.
The city grew out of a colony of oscan speaking descendants of Neolithic inhabitants of Campania. Pre-Roman Pompeii, as part of Campania, received a complex set of cultural influences. The Etruscans to the north, the Greek settlers to the south, and the Samnites and other Italian peoples all around. The city was a Samnite town for centuries before coming under Roman rule at the time of Lucius Cornelius Sulla around the 1st century BC. In 80 BC, Pompeii was incorporated into Rome as a colony. The citizens of Pompeii were granted Roman citizenship and the city's institutions, architecture, and culture were Romanized. At its peak, Pompeii had a thriving economy based on trade and agriculture and the city supported between 10,000 and 20,000 inhabitants. As Rome itself grew in prosperity, its citizens looked to Pompeii as a luxury resort, and soon the luxurious country houses of the world's most powerful people surrounded the coastline. The construction technique of the city of Pompeii is interesting. In fact, the inhabitants used lava to make and create bricks and many other things. The streets of Pompeii were filled with blocks of lava melted into stone. The inhabitants used gravel or ashes, whatever they could, to build the walls of a house or a store. Mosaics were very popular for decorating houses. Mosaic ornamentation was widely used in decoration of houses. Lava bricks were also used for public baths. The habits and ways of life in Roman times have been revealed in great detail in Pompeii by the plan of the streets and paths, the public buildings decorated with statues, and the simple stores and houses of artisans. The houses and villas have provided rare and beautiful examples of Roman art. Among the most famous are the houses of the Vedi, the Villa of the Mysteries, and in the suburbs of Pompeii, the Villa of Bosco Real. The slopes of Vesuvius were therefore known for their fertile soils, and the wine in Pompeii was an important export product. At least one jar of wine made its way to England. But people were less aware of the dark side of the volcano. The city had been severely damaged by several earthquakes 15 years before the eruption, yet none of this was related to volcanism, so there was nothing to fear. Located in the Bay of Naples, Pompeii is ideally located. The bay is an important area for the entire Roman Empire, and for good reason, most of the empire's maritime traffic passed through the port of Pompeii, making the Bay of Naples a major trading area. The city is a lively city, cosmopolitan, with a thousand languages. People come and go, there are many different merchants and restaurants, animated, the city never stops. Which visitor could imagine that the first time he visits the ruins of Pompeii today? So, Pompeii was a bustling city nearly 2,000 years ago in what is now southern Italy. But in the fall of 79, the nearby volcano Vesuvius erupted. It spewed smoke and toxic gases 30 kilometers or 18 miles into the air, which quickly spread throughout the city. Overnight, Pompeii and a large part of its 10,000 inhabitants disappeared under a layer of ash. By the way, did you know that the word volcano appeared with the Pompeii disaster? Indeed, the term is taken from Roman mythology. Vulcan was the god of fire, and we can unfortunately say that the term god of fire was appropriate in this day of October 24th, 79. First of all, many of you have certainly already asked yourselves this question. Why didn't the inhabitants of Pompeii escape? The threat was rumbling without anyone realizing the danger. Like any historical event, we must first put the elements in their context. 
The first thing to know is that at the time, people did not have all the knowledge and scientific experience that we have today. The people of Pompeii could not have known what a volcano was, let alone the consequences of it. For the Pompeians, Vesuvius was a simple mountain of which they could not see the crater on its summit. It is necessary to know that they even venerated the mountain. They perceived it as a protector of the city. Of course, they had already experienced many tremors, but never a volcanic eruption at the time. So why run away when you have no idea what's going on, when you're used to tremors, and above all, when we think that we attribute them to the wrath of the gods, and that we think that Vesuvius can save us? Here is why the majority of the Pompeians did not flee in this day of October 24th, 79. They had no idea what an eruption was and the terrible consequences of it. Also, it is necessary to know that Vesuvius was already rumbling for several days and that the Pompeians were preparing to celebrate the Volcanalia i.e. sacrificial rituals to appease the god of fire. At that time, the city was still under reconstruction, a violent earthquake having taken place 17 years earlier. This violent earthquake of estimated magnitude 5 according to the damage caused significant damage to Pompeii and Herculaneum. Seneca also reported that after this earthquake, many sheep perished in the vicinity of Vesuvius as a result of toxic gas fumes. As you can imagine, this reconstruction will never be finished. The Vesuvius spitting all its stones, the population of the city will be buried under several meter of ashes for many years. So we all know the story of Pompeii, that of the volcano that erupted, but contrary to what many think, Pompeii is not only an eruption that lasted a few minutes, this one happened in several stages and in several hours. On October 24th, after centuries of dormancy, Mount Vesuvius erupted in southern Italy, devastating the prosperous Roman cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum and killing thousands. The cities, buried under a thick layer of volcanic material and mud, were never rebuilt and were forgotten throughout history until their rediscovery hundreds of years later. It is six o'clock in the morning. The sun rises in the city. Early in the morning, the inhabitants are going about their daily tasks. We can already hear the merchants setting up their stalls and the sound of horses in the streets. It is the usual effervescence. Eight o'clock in the morning. The crowded marketplace of Pompeii bursts into a deafening boom. A violent earthquake shakes the ground, unbalancing the buyers and overturning the fish and meat stalls. Several tremors will occur in the morning, more and more significant. Even if the inhabitants are used to these tremors, they are more serious than usual. What the Pompeians do not know is that the magma chamber of Vesuvius is full and is about to explode. A cloud of gas and ash appears above Mount Vesuvius. For four days, small earthquakes are felt in Pompeii. 12 p.m. This time, it is not earthquakes that the inhabitants feel, because now it is the volcano which starts to rumble, a volcano that the Pompeians take for a simple mountain. At that time, we must not forget that the Romans were very religious. At that moment, they think then that God shows his displeasure, and that it is therefore for this reason that the mountain rumbles. One p.m. It is the hour of the lunch and the usual leisure. The majority of the Pompeians are at the theater or at home praying to the gods so that they can calm their anger. Everything still seems normal in the city. The inhabitants are not panicked, even if some worried voices begin to be heard. 
but nevertheless, a few minutes after 1 p.m., a huge noise is heard. A boom, deafening, screaming. It is the very first phase of the volcanic eruption. The magma explodes on contact with the atmosphere. Like a bottle of champagne, the molten rock is then ejected from the volcano. Contrary to what we imagine when we talk about eruption, the lava does not flow from the volcano. It is, in fact, ejected into the air. A few seconds after the eruption, a new landscape for the Pompeians never seen before. Confused, the inhabitants do not know what to do. It is the first time they see a volcano explode. For them, it was only a mountain. They leave their belongings in place. While some flee, most take refuge at home or in buildings. For the moment, there are no victims yet. It is already a quarter of an hour since the eruption began. The volcano spits its terrible black smoke. A column of ashes rises on the horizon, well above the volcano. In only half an hour, it reaches an altitude of more than 30 kilometers. At this height, it is the stratosphere. We are well beyond the flight of current airliners. Imagine a huge mushroom cloud in the sky. This is the terrible scenery of the sky of Pompeii at that time. One hour after the eruption, the sun or any other form of light is now completely hidden. Pompeii falls into total darkness, a deep black. Not the evening of the night where you can still make out the stars or the moon, no, it is now an impenetrable black. It is the famous ash cloud. Indeed, the famous column that was above the volcano has now arrived on the city. The Pompeians begin to understand that the hour is serious and see their life passing under their eyes. Two hours after the eruption, the picture is terrifying. Pompeii has completely disappeared under the darkness. The inhabitants who stayed hidden at home still can't see anything. No light passes. Three hours after the eruption, leaving the city is now mission impossible. The whole city is covered by the ash cloud. Unfortunately, many inhabitants thought that staying at home would protect them, but the worst is yet to come. Suddenly, thousands of tons of stones fall on Pompeii. The sky turns into a brewery. The first buildings of Pompeii begin to collapse under the weight of ash and stones. Fist-sized volcanic rocks called lithics begin to hit Pompeii, and many inhabitants flee to the port. The bombardment of ash, pumice, and lithics continued for 18 hours. Passersby trying to flee outside are knocked out, and some die from this real deadly rain. But it does not only rain stones, it also rains ashes. It is panic. The ash literally burns the skin and the flesh. A violent smell of sulfur is present in the streets. Some people die crushed in the crowd. Outside, the panic is total. It is absolute. It is nine hours since the eruption started. The complete darkness is still present. But Pompeii is buried more and more. Some surviving inhabitants trying to flee end up succumbing under the persistent avalanche of stones, which lasts for hours. Thousands have perished in an avalanche disaster. A handful of survivors, about 800, are now trapped still hiding in their homes. And yet, the worst is yet to come for them.
It is midnight. We cannot discern if it is day or night as the ash cloud is thick. 11 hours after the eruption, Pompeii is now completely buried under meters of pumice, but suddenly, not a sound. The rock falls are not heard anymore. It's the calm before the storm. The eruption cloud, which is now 32 kilometers high, almost 20 miles high, collapses and starts to descend onto Pompeii and its neighboring cities. The apocalypse is unleashed on the cities surrounding the volcano. It is 6 o'clock in the morning, a morning of October 25th, 79, when a part of Italy will not get up. That's it. The famous burning cloud arrives. This cloud, also called pyroclastic flows, is synonymous with imminent death for the Pompeians. With the speed approaching more than 100 kilometers an hour, that is to say 62 miles an hour, and a temperature exceeding 300 degrees Celsius, or 570 degrees Fahrenheit, this burning cloud completely devours the city. Composed of toxic gas, dust, and large propelled stones, it arrives on the city very quickly. No one, no matter how well hidden, can be protected. This cloud from the underworld is known to melt the lead tin silver used by the inhabitants. Anyone still alive is instantly killed by a thermal shock. Death is then imminent and excruciating. It is said that the inhabitants of Pompeii died in three stages. First, because of the shockwave, they are knocked out. The bodies explode. The air, unbreathable and toxic, full of dust, suffocates them. Their bodies are burned, charred. There are no survivors. It is inescapable. One day was enough to choose the fate of this city. Frozen for eternity, more than 2,000 Pompeians died after the eruption. Vesuvius poured its wrath on Pompeii and other nearby cities, killing more than 15,000 people. Monuments, houses, stores, streets, humans, animals, everything is engulfed under meters and meters of ash. The days passed, and now Pompeii is buried under 25 meters, that is to say, more than 82 feet of volcanic ash and pumice. Despite the thieves who run away with the statues of the Forum and the marble of the walls, the city will be almost completely forgotten. Time passes, writings are found. We know that the city existed, but we do not know where it is. Pompeii had disappeared. The city was completely wiped off the map. It is only in 1592 that the city again sees the rays of the sun, when workmen, digging a channel to divert the water of the river Sarno, hit ancient walls covered with frescoes and inscriptions. In particular, they brought to light a stone bearing the inscription De Curio Pompeii meaning a member of the Senate of Pompeii. But the city will have benefited only a few hours of light because once the work is completed, they've covered the trench. The decision to cover the paintings could be seen both as an act of censorship because of the erotic content of some paintings and as the desire to preserve in the hostile climate of the time. It was in 1709 that an incredible discovery was made. In a field, a statue was first found. Excavations began. What destroyed it, preserved it. Pompeii exists again. Like a hidden treasure, the city has always been there, but its existence and location was no longer known. The bodies of humans, but also of animals are found. Despite the passage of time, Everything is molded and preserved. It is as if the eruption had taken place a few months ago. Fear and anguish can still be read on these beings of stone. The hell and the apocalypse 
which will have lasted only a fraction of seconds on the scale of time, has been engraved in marble for millennia. Today, Vesuvius is extremely monitored. It even has its own dedicated control center. Constantly under the eyes of scientists, the volcano is always active. An eruption, perhaps huge, will happen again. Scientists are almost certain. The stakes are high because today, the area around Vesuvius is very urbanized and the red zone, the risk zone around the volcano, includes more than 700,000 inhabitants. A procedure exists now in case another potential eruption would occur. Will it be as catastrophic as the one in 79 AD? It's impossible to predict that in advance, at least not for the moment. Were there any witnesses to the eruption? The answer is yes. Vesuvius erupted near Pompeii in 79 AD killing thousands of people and wiping entire towns off the map. And a Roman teenager named Pliny the Younger witnessed it. Pompeii had no survivors, but other cities around Naples also experienced the eruption and there were survivors who witnessed it. Pliny the Younger was one of them and his firsthand account of the eruption of Vesuvius is the closest historians can come to describing what Pompeii was like during those final terrifying hours. When Vesuvius erupted, Pliny the Younger was about 18 years old. He and his mother Plinia were staying at his uncle Pliny the Elder's villa in Messinum, a Roman naval base in the Bay of Naples. The scholar Pliny the Elder commanded the Roman fleet at Messinum. On October 24, 79 AD, the members of this small family went about their daily business. In the early afternoon, Vesuvius erupted in Messinum, which radically changed the course of the day. It is likely that many other people witnessed the eruption that destroyed Pompeii, but none of them recorded their experience for historians to study. Pliny seems to have been the only witness to have left a handwritten account of what happened in 79 CE. Several years after the event, he wrote his recollections in a series of letters to the Roman historian Tacitus. Thanks to these ancient letters, scholars and historians can get an idea of what it was like to live through one of the natural disasters that marked history. Thus, he will describe the eruption for Tacitus. At this distance, it was not clear from which mountain the cloud rose. It was later known that it was Vesuvius. Its general appearance may be described as that of an umbrella, for it rose to a great height on a sort of trunk and then separated into branches. I imagined that it was pushed upward by the first breath and was no longer supported when the pressure decreased or else it was supported by its own weight so that it gradually spread and dispersed. In places it was white, elsewhere mottled and dirty, depending on the amount of soil and ash it carried with it. This was the phreatomagmatic phase, which lasted for hours. These phreatomagmatic eruptions occur when rising magma meets surface water, like groundwater. We know that people close to the volcano were terrified. One of Pliny the Elder's friends, Rectina, who lived at the base of the volcano, implored him to call for help. She could only escape by boat. Pliny embarked with warships to save her, but unfortunately, to surrender to death. But then, when did these witnesses realize that the hour was serious? First of all, an icy cloud was looming over the volcano, signaling that trouble was brewing. The strange scene was reported to Pliny by his mother in the early afternoon of October 24th, 79 CE. It is likely that Pliny, his mother, and his uncle did not realize that the cloud they were seeing was actually volcanic debris ejected from Vesuvius. Then it was there that an ominous darkness fell over the Bay of Naples. 
Pliny observed that a strange cloud blocked the sun and spread an ominous darkness over the Bay of Naples. According to witnesses, this darkness was darker than the thickest night. Both cities were several miles from Pompeii, but even there, a thick darkness settled in Misenum, an eerie darkness like that of a room whose lights had been turned off. At last, the terrible darkness dissipated like a cloud of smoke. While daylight pierced the darkness and even the sun shone, but with a dull light as when an eclipse is about to begin, Pliny recalls. In the towns near the volcano, people who had not fled tried to take shelter inside buildings to protect themselves from the pumice rain. Some people who died outside had their skulls fractured by ballistic rocks. The falling pumice made it terribly difficult to escape from Pompeii. What other choice did the inhabitants have but to take shelter? Pompeii and its surrounding towns are still dominated by the ancient volcano that froze an entire civilization in time. Did you know that it has erupted several times since 79 AD? Another major eruption took place in 1944, during World War II. The events of March 17, 1944 were not widely publicized until months later, which shows how out of place and tense the situation was. While the people of San Sebastiano were already suffering the consequences of invasions and bombings, the terror was not yet over. A slow flow of lava, rocks, and ashes shook the city for a week and a half from March 17th. Initially, the 39th Bombardment Group on the other side of Vesuvius was not too concerned about the volcanic eruption, believing that it would not affect them. But finally, a few hours later, the group was evacuated. There were no military deaths during the eruption, but a large number of aircraft were destroyed. As a result, the news spread to the Germans who believed that the entire squadron had been destroyed. In reality, the 39th Bombardment Group had survived and had been moved to another area without the knowledge of the Germans. Pompeii was not the only city destroyed by the eruption of Vesuvius. In fact, Herculaneum was also destroyed in the eruption of 79 AD, but also the small neighboring towns of Aplantis and Stabiae. Herculaneum is much more than what has been discovered, even if only a small part of it has been discovered. It should be noted that Pompeii and Herculaneum were not destroyed in the same way by the volcano. Indeed, while the inhabitants of Pompeii died of suffocation after inhaling toxic fumes and were then covered with ashes, if they had not already been hit by stones falling from the sky, the inhabitants of Herculaneum died of heat. In fact, the temperature was over 510 degrees Celsius, or over 950 degrees Fahrenheit. A lava flow has, unlike the city of Pompeii, covered Herculaneum. During the excavations, all the cavities were filled with a thick mud, which made the excavation complicated. The ancient city lies below the present one, which also made the excavations very difficult. Herculaneum was not as large as Pompeii, but it was a resort town where the Roman aristocracy stayed. Often two stories high, its large residences were sumptuously decorated and surrounded by gardens. There was an air of refinement everywhere. Mosaics, frescoes, and gargoyles adorned the buildings. The fountains were elegant, and the porticos of the houses carefully lined the cobbled streets. Hercules built the city, which had a magnificent theater that could seat 2,500 people. At Herculaneum, some 300 skeletons of people were discovered sunken with their boats near the shore in 1982.
Although the inhabitants tried to escape by sea, the raging waves prevented them from doing so. It is captivating to discover hidden or forgotten cities. Pompeii was buried in a few seconds during the eruption of Vesuvius. The ashes and mephitic gases preserved all that existed of the Roman city. Although buried for 2,000 years, one can still imagine the inhabitants of Pompeii going about their daily business, working on their farms or going to the market. Parts of the site remain undiscovered, and excavation and research teams are still trying to reveal the secrets of this mysterious city. The city is now one of the most amazing archaeological sites in the world, as lava, ash, and pumice have enveloped the entire city and preserved it for over a thousand years. Although it is a great archaeological find, it is suffering today. Pompeii has always been threatened with destruction. Fiorelli excavated the site during the first archaeological phase, when it was poorly guarded and often looted. During the reign of Charles III, he enriched his own house with objects from the site. Another method of preserving frescoes and paintings was to varnish them. A very popular building in Pompeii, the Armaturarum, was a training arena for gladiators. And more crazy, during the excavations of Pompeii, fresh bread was found in the bread ovens, which were working at the time of the eruption of Vesuvius. The large sites of Pompeii were also damaged by the constant excavations that were carried out. During the eruption of the city, volcanic debris trapped many people in time. Plaster casts were used to understand how these people died. Archaeologists working on the ruins of Pompeii have discovered an ingenious way to reconstruct some of their findings. When the lava from the 79 AD eruption cooled, it solidified around all the objects that had not been able to escape. Over the centuries, many of these objects decomposed, leaving hollows in the solid lava. Archaeologists fill these cavities with liquid plaster. The liquid plaster is allowed to harden, and the lava can then be chipped away, providing an accurate cast of what was trapped by the lava flow nearly 2,000 years ago. This process is useful for the study of the site, but it also destroys the naturally solidified envelope of the object being studied. Once the lava is removed, the figure is eliminated forever, making way for a plaster filling. The original casting is now gone, another piece of history that must be destroyed to find answers. Pompeii was a wealthy Roman seaside resort, well-groomed and popular with wealthy vacationers. Well-paved streets had high sidewalks and steps to keep pedestrians out of the mud. People relaxed in public baths, watched gladiatorial or chariot fights in an amphitheater, went to the markets a lot, and enjoyed themselves. But this world was turned upside down in the space of a few moments. Neither the ancient city nor the millions of tourists it welcomes every year were built to last for centuries. To preserve Pompeii forever, archaeologists are laser scanning its surface to create a digital version. In the coming years, the digital replica of Pompeii will be available, which means that the ancient city will finally be saved from the cruelest fate, to disappear again and be forgotten.